One thing that I thought I'd note, uh, which sort of feels kind of fitting um, today, some nice words have been said my way. And um, so to, to um, sort of pass it back in a sense, this logo that we created, um, and I'm glad I said we in a sense, <laughs> uh, um, for the center um, has a kind of meaning of sorts. Um, the triscal or triscola um, is quite an ancient uh, symbol. I'm sure Ali could probably tell you a few things about it more than, than I know. But one of the components, so I kind of borrowed, in a sense, um, a few different threes. I like threes. Uh, I like fours as well. But threes, threes are nice. And, uh, and one of the components here is, is community. Uh, in, in the context of, uh, I don't want to get too lost in, a, in framework, but Buddhism, um, you have Buddha uh, Sangha for community and Dharma. And, and the community is one that um, I feel today coming here, I always do coming to Breaking Convention, but um, community means a, a huge amount to me. I imagine it does for others, but I feel like community and this special community that we have with the psychedelic community, whatever that is, however you think of it, is something very, very special. And I feel it sort of, it sort of carries me in a way and keeps me right, you know, keeps me on the path. And I think that's probably what, what's meant with community, with Sangha in the context of, of Buddhism. So um, there, we have, there we have that little bit. <laughs> and now on to some, some uh, science. So if we are to try and tackle this question of how psychedelics work, there's a really important place to start. We are looking at drugs here. These are molecules, and we know their molecular structure. And we also know where they bind to in the body and the brain uh, to begin their remarkable effects. And we know that that's the serotonin 2A receptor We've known that for about, gosh, um, in 1980s, um, yeah, a good while. Um, but the evidence for it now, I think it's fair to say, is very compelling. So what is the evidence? And we can run through that now. First of all, we have these nice PET images where you can see where in the human brain, in the living human brain, these important psychedelic receptors, in a sense, uh, are. And Remember this pattern, we're going to focus on it later on. It's very, very important. It may even be the essential gradient, if you want, the essential pattern that defines our consciousness as weird animals called human beings. This may be a pattern that is somewhat special, perhaps even exclusive to the human animal. Uh, and the important message at this point is, this is where you find these receptors that psychedelics work on. If you block those receptors with what we call an antagonist, a blocker, and then give a psychedelic, you won't trip, you won't meet God, you know? Uh, so there's some grounding, um, grounding uh, uh, sort of evidences here that help to uh, remind us, I think in a healthy way, that the experiences of nature and to um, excite us about how remarkable uh, nature is. Um, so this is where these receptors are. They're, in, they're hot. They're heavily expressed in what I'll call the human system for a few good reasons. And as I said, if you block these receptors, give a psychedelic, you'll block the effects of the psychedelic that's been shown uh, in so many different studies, now with different psychedelics, um, different teams. We also know, and really this was what started to make a difference for understanding the importance of this particular serotonin receptor, that there seems to be a selective, whenever you find selective or specific relationships in science, you kind of know you're onto something important. And still to this day, there seems to be a selective relationship between the affinity, the binding potential, the stickiness, if you want, of a given psychedelic drug for this receptor, no other receptor, receptors, to my knowledge, and the potency of a classic psychedelic. And you can almost work out, if you know, for example, the binding potential 
of mescaline for the serotonin 2A receptor, what kind of dose you would need to give to get the um, signature psychedelic effects. And it turns out it's quite a high dose because unlike LSD, mescaline has a much lower order of, of magnitude affinity for the 2A receptor. It still stimulates the receptor. That's what all of these drugs do. They kind of mimic serotonin in a sense, They're like serotonin imposters, they hijack the serotonin system and this particular aspect of it. Um, but uh, um, they come in and they stimulate and it's that stickiness that confers the potency of a drug. So LSD, very, very sticky. And that's why you only need such small amounts for it to have its psychedelic effects. Now we have this, you caught a glimpse of it in David's talk. And this is, for me is just kind of like the, the sort of auctioneer's hammer, you know, it kind of confirms in a sense uh, the importance of the receptor. Here we're looking at um, short story, the percentage of available serotonin to A receptors occupied by different doses of psilocybin. And when you get occupancy up around 60% plus, which require doses around 20 milligrams of psilocybin plus, you get this big uh, leap up in, in intensity. Um, so it's just for me, I think, confirmatory evidence. And so there's a, there's a kind of pillar in a sense, a, um, uh, a cornerstone uh, from which to move. And then a natural question from there is, um, uh, what does the serotonin 2A receptor do? I mean, it would be easy to get kind of, let our imaginations run wild. Um, I'm just trying to look for, yeah, good, uh, timing. Um, and think that they are somehow there for psychedelics, but I don't think that's true. I think they're probably there. It would stand to reason for their naturally occurring, what we call ligand or, or chemical in the body and brain that uh, binds to, to the receptor, and that's serotonin itself. Um, so then you ask the question, well, what happens when you activate this, this receptor? And the short story is that now there's a wealth of evidence um, at a number of different levels that um, the action of serotonin 2A receptor stimulation is to increase plasticity. And I say it intentionally as one word because plasticity, the dictionary definition, is a phenomenon, a system if you want, or a phenomenon that is um, able to be shaped or molded. So if you increase plasticity, you're increasing the ability of that thing, whatever it is, to be shaped or molded. Another shorter way of collapsing it down, you could say it's the ability to change. And plasticity often gets kind of wrongly uh, caught up with neuroplasticity. Sure, that's you know, hot topic in, in neuroscience, um, but plasticity, the ability to change, goes beyond just change in the brain. But let's run through some, some of these changes. The markers of neuroplasticity now, there are studies coming out almost every month showing increases in particularly cortical markers of neuroplasticity with 2A agonism. There's so much these days, it's hard to keep up. This paper that you can see the schematic from, they're uh, showing increases in aspects of synaptogenesis. Uh, the growth of the communication aspects of neurons um, is, is really quite a seminal piece now from David Olson's group. Um, and uh, this is an older one looking at BDNF, a certain marker of plasticity in the brain. And this is a neat one I like to show because it emphasizes the, the, the effect is massive in the cortex and actually in an aspect of the subcortex, the duntate gyrus in the hippocampus. Do I have a thing? Oh, yeah, I do. It's, it's actually gone down, but in, in the cortex, in these rodents, a, a near doubling of expression of this plasticity marker. Uh, and then we can look at other readouts of plasticity. Remember, broadly defined, here we're looking at learning in rabbits and learning rate uh, being sped up with a 2A agonist, in this case LSD, and then slowed down or retarded with a 2A uh, blocker. Now, the finding that probably excites me almost more than anything, I think, in recent years in, in psychedelic science, that's quite a thing to say, um, is, uh, is this one. And you'll find it in the journal Neuron, a very leading 
uh, Brain Science Journal, and, and there they're showing that brain growth itself, and actually it was the stimulation of what are called basal progenitor cells. These are neural stem cells. These are the cells, cells that are needed to make neurons. What's weird about the human brain is the sheer number of neurons that we have, particularly in the cortex and particularly in the human system, where the 2A receptors are. And this finding showed that, again, with a degree of selectivity, stimulation of the 2A receptor um, increased the proliferation of these basal progenitor cells. The authors were so excited by that finding that in the abstract, they linked it to the evolution of the human brain itself. Now, this is very fresh. This came out last year. And think about the implications for a second. Um, and many of you will be familiar with the, the somewhat famous stoned ape hypothesis of Terence McKenna. Um, when I, f I saw this finding, uh, Tommaso uh, put me onto it from our group. Um, yeah, it was kind of like um, a sort of uh, re, you know, re rekindling that, that kind of idea. And, and it suggested, in a sense, that McKenna was close. He might not quite have been on the money in saying that it was eating mushrooms in the savannah, I think it was, that, uh, um, that uh, increased the, the capacity of the human brain, started the, uh, catalyzing the expansion of the human cortex. But it suggests that the receptors that psychedelics hijack may well have done that. Just reflect on that for a moment. I think it's absolutely uh, remarkable. So um, put that into context as, as, as we go on and look at a few other aspects of, of brain and the action of psychedelics. We could look at other domains of plasticity here, behavioral and psychological plasticity, also being increased uh, through uh, psychedelics, through 2A agonism. Now, this is, uh, is a complicated one. <laughs> I've got to confess, I haven't, I feel I've got it entirely uh, sort of worked out in a sense, but it's asking this question, okay, so we know 2A receptors are really important, essential, essentially, and we know that they're linked to plasticity, and that's like a key property that you get from stimulating these receptors. So then another question is, well, what kind of function, what kind of pressures would engage this system, essentially sort of framing the question in an evolutionary way. Why do we have these receptors? And then you think, well, plasticity's got to be useful. I would say not all of the time, but maybe some of the time, and maybe under conditions of particular adversity, maybe when you need transformation, maybe transformation becomes a matter of life or death. So it was kind of... That, that sort of set some context for making sense of some findings that I've been picking up over the years, looking at uh, changes in, in the levels of 2A receptor availability, also the sensitivity of these receptors to, to being activated, and finding that uh, it was often in cases of, of stress, uh, punishment paradigms, adverse conditions, that you'd see an upregulation in this receptor. So I've kind of pulled these findings in a review article with a, a US student, Ari uh, Brower. And we uh, summarized that, to summarize <laughs> what we wrote about that in the so-called Pivotal Mental States paper. But the short story is that what we found was quite a lot of evidence for stress, conditions of adversity. And so you might think, OK, conditions under which it pays to be adaptable, it pays to be plastic, conditions of evolutionary pressure seem to upregulate this plasticity system. So that was kind of the short of, of that long uh, process of collating those findings. And also the most reliable way to release serotonin in the body and the brain uh, beyond taking uh, methadrone or MDMA is... Uh, is stress, punishment paradigms. You can see the, the spike in serotonin release here with these different punishment paradigms. I mean, uh, you know, I'm no fan of animal research, but uh, this is quite compelling uh, stuff, seeing this spike in, in serotonin release from tail pinch uh, handling and swim stress there. 
Um, so there you get a kind of double whammy of the system upregulating with um, kind of chronic stress. Um, hypoxia seems to be a particularly reliable way to upregulate the 2A system, and I think that's interesting in the context of breath work. Um, there's also some recent evidence of hypoxia being linked to enhanced tryptamine metabolism as well. Um, but you, you have that background of chronic stress and the, the system being primed and then acute stress with serotonin release onto that prime system. So that was the model of how you might have, if you want, a naturally occurring psychedelic or psychedelic-like experience. And that's summarized in this Pivotal Mental States paper. And one important part of the sort of narrative there in that paper is that uh, these states are outcome agnostic. Uh, and this is, again, something that I would confess I haven't quite worked out um, because of the, the kind of million dollar or could it be billion dollar question of is there anything intrinsically healing about the substances themselves? I mean, people project that property into the substances themselves, but really they, the more sort of logical question is, do the substances catalyze an intrinsic healing that the brain and mind and body can do and can know? I think that's an absolutely fascinating question, and I've got to admit that I'm tempted in the direction of thinking there's, there's something there. Um, however, <laughs> In this particular paper, we framed the outcomes of a so-called pivotal mental state, one of these hyperplastic states that can be engaged by 2A stimulation, for example, under conditions of, of particular adversity. Uh, yes, that they're outcome agnostic, but hypersensitive to the environment and the conditions, the contextual conditions into which they occur, such that if those conditions are supportive and nurturing in a kind of ideal way, then one can pivot from pathology towards uh, health. But the opposite could also happen, that under conditions of further stress and adversity and this hyperplastic state, one could move towards um, pathology, you might say. And, and yes, we brought in psychosis and kind of musings, musings, is that the right word? Reflections on whether some kind of early plasticity um, rooted in a negative direction, and perhaps a role for the 2A receptor there could be involved in the development of psychotic disorders. That's not to say that there's a hard link between the psychedelic experience and psychosis. That would be a misunderstanding of this, but maybe in the psychotic process early on, there may be some similarities. And I think if you look at the phenomenology of early psychosis, uh, that starts to look quite interesting I was going to say compelling, but uh, maybe just interesting. Um, so this slide works to summarize, in a way, what could easily be you know, a bunch of whole talks on psychedelic uh, medicine. But there are some important take-home points to emphasize. The first one is that all of these studies that are exciting us all, uh, bringing in all this investment into psychedelic medicine, have manipulated the context, as you would hope and, and as makes sense, in a positive way, in a therapeutic way. But let's not forget that. In a sense, there haven't been any controls to that, uh, to those conditions. And so the importance of set and setting is a kind of staple uh, uh, assumption in, in the research. Um, but um, how influential is it? And, it, and that science hasn't really been done yet but all we can say is that to my knowledge all of the studies uh, all of the trials all of the, the clinical studies have involved music listening for example do pull me up if you know an exception but they've also all involved supervision with usually two guides sometimes one but usually two and um, so this is the default this is the default and and this is where we're getting the evidence from so that's just so important to, to realize and, uh, and, and think about. Also, the improvements, yes, they appear to be rapid and enduring. If plasticity is in the body and the brain, but also in the mind and in behavior, the essential thing here, a recent finding that's only in preprint, I think, at the moment, 
is some evidence of um, enduring um, synaptogenesis, the growth of the communicating aspects of the neurons, enduring effects out at one month after I think it was a single administration of psilocybin. So starting to put a bit of biology, I suppose, on what we see and know when we look at the psychological presentation. Um, and then this transdiagnostic action at a number of different disorders. We know they're not, in a sense, so separate from each other, really, in a sense, only in sort of manifestation or how they present themselves. But I think a lot of us intuit that there's something core, there are core denominators to um, different, uh, differently expressing psychiatric disorders. And so the fact that positive evidence is being found for a range of different disorders is very interesting and is worth further reflection. And this slide tries to say something about that by drawing our attention, in a sense, to what might be the common denominator in not every, but a lot of psychiatric disorders. And here the idea is one of, I could use different terms, reinforcement, uh, canalization is a fancy word, um, makes me think of canals, you know, that only go in one particular direction. There's no flexibility there, it's, it's this way or no other way. But the idea is that as ways of thinking and behaving become reinforced, become stamped in. Why does that happen? You could say that's another question, but I don't think you can get away with that. It's part of the picture. You know, you, you would, for me, think about responses to adversity, to trauma, to complex trauma. Um, however, you know, abstract that trauma, that adversity might be, I think it's logical to see these symptoms that arise as attempts to, um, to adapt, in a sense, to, to, that, to that hardship. And, um, and uh, so, in a sense, these symptoms are maladaptive, but also adaptive. Of course, you, you know, and I know that I'm not the first to say this, and like the likes of Gabor Mate and so on, talked about this much, but uh, I just think it's healthy to, to, to put this in our focus. And so whether it's the negative cognitive biases in depression or um, uh, specific anxieties or specific addictions or addictions more generally, eating and image disorders, the obsessions and compulsions in, in OCD, I do think there's a common space here of what I, what I put here, but I change this, you know, virtually every talk I sort of change the wording, but the point is the same, reinforced maladaptive habits uh, or biases of mind and or behavior. Um, so that's, that's the target in a sense. And I think if we can appreciate that, then it's easier, it's easier if it's right to find a solution. And that's where you know, I think it makes sense to think of psychedelic medicine, psychedelic therapy as working as a solution to this, to this, you know, canalization of mind and or behavior. Um, and so there where the plasticity comes in to relax these reinforced ways of thinking and behaving. And so there lies the opportunity. But back to that billion dollar question, do you just need the drug? Well, probably not is all our uh, intuitions. Uh, um, and that combination, that marriage, in a sense, between psychological support, the psychotherapy, the supportive context and container, and the drug-induced plasticity is where I think we all intuit the synergy lies. If we intuit it, I think we've got to test it better. Um, and quite what it is as well, understanding what that is, the inner healer. What is that in the body and the brain and the mind? It's something, isn't it? That knowing that was being referred to earlier. It's something. We can, I, you know, we can find that, I think. That's the quest anyway. So this is a, a major um, abrupt tangent onto uh, something that's very relevant, but it's still an abrupt tangent. And it's how do, if we use brain imaging, functional brain imaging, to look into the brain on psychedelics, what do we see? And these uh, images from our work with psilocybin have now become 
kind of gone around the world. I think there was centerfold in Michael Pollan's book, uh, How to Change Your Mind. There's also street art in London. Was it in London? Maybe not. But anyway, someone turned this into to street art. Um, what's it showing? It's showing that um, different regions in the brain around the periphery of the circles ordinarily tend to be quite cliquish in their, in their communication, like at a party, a university party, all the people studying maths or whatever would talk to each other and those doing English would talk, you know, but the psychedelic party, <laughs> like breaking convention. Everyone's talking to everyone. And uh, so there's a little clue in, and, and we've seen uh, similar things, and other teams have, um, uh, kind of addressing this question in slightly different ways here, looking at the communication profile of the primary visual cortex, V1, and seeing this much more expanded communication profile under LSD. And then here with DMT, similar kind of picture, these hot colors are regions that are becoming much more communicative with the rest of the brain, much less uh, cut off or discreet from the rest of the brain under the psychedelic than ordinarily. And so uh, some of the more recent analyses we've done have been more dynamic in nature. We've looked at states that the brain enters and then moves away from. And this is a much truer representation, of course, of, of brain function to get more into the dynamics. And uh, what we're looking at here are an array of eight uh, what you might call substates. They also correspond to brain networks that are uh, becoming increasingly well um, understood. And the short story is that um, there are certain states, if you want, that correspond to networks or systems that are, that are diminished in how much they're visited, the proportion of, of them being visited under a psychedelic. Here, DMT, but we found the same thing with LSD and psilocybin. And what are those states? Well, they turn out they're states that overlap with the human system, where the 2A receptors are most densely expressed. And the, the state that's visited most is one that is more globally uh, coherent, if you want. Um, and uh, this, is, this is intriguing. Um, and, you know, I think I wanted to go to this one. Um, uh, in a sense, a, a narrative that seemed to catch people's imagination was disintegration of the default mode network. That's ego dissolution. And in a sense, I'm guilty as much as anyone, probably more guilty than anyone, for popularizing that view. I, do you know, I think it's, it's true, but such is science, it's not all the way true. You know, it's, a, it's partly true. Um, and I think what we're uh, we have the privilege of seeing now is a sort of enrichment of, of the picture that yes, networks break down. The, the, the uh, strength of the communication between the nodes, the different bits of the network that make up that network becomes less under a psychedelic. You can interpret that as a disintegration because it's going down, it's reducing from the integrity of that system. And we did see correlations with ego dissolution um, but quite how selective they are, you know, there's a degree of selectivity, but, um, but uh, you know, it's not just the DMN, not just the default mode network um, that disintegrates under psychedelics. It's a broad range of networks, and perhaps particularly the high-level networks, those networks that overlap with the human system, the aspect of our brains that seem to be especially expanded in, in our species. Um, and so I would say the picture is more about DMN plus is how I put it these days. And actually, you know, I playfully refer to the, to the human system um, as, uh, as uh, how to think about this, because it does bring this context in. And this is, you know, it's actually kind of my favorite slide. Um, at the moment, um, and I could probably put about, I don't know, 20 more brains on here showing this pattern. And actually, there is a review paper recently come out, again in Neuron, uh, this one here, that talks about this pattern, this principal gradient that is so especially um, clear in, in the human brain. Uh, and let's look at some of these properties. So just a reminder that the 2A receptor 
is in the human system, the hottest expression is in this human system. Why am I calling it a human system? Well, here's a map of cortical expansion from macaque monkeys, where we have the most data into the human, and there's the pattern. Very close correspondence. We can formalize it with correlations, and, and they, come, they come up as strong. This is expansion from being a baby into an adult human, and again, there's some correspondence there. This is looking at the functional connectivity, sort of um, picture the different regions and what they connect to, what they communicate with most, and what you find is that the transmodal association cortex, cortex involved in particularly high-level functions, if you find a region over here, its strongest connection is going to be with another part of this pattern, the human system, uh, and weakest with cortex involved in more rudimentary sensory and motor function. So in a kind of intuitive hierarchical sense, and you're going to see that in a moment, um, we have this gradient that goes from sensory motor function to abstract cognition, the cognition that we seem to uh, have as human beings. I was going to say enjoy, and then I was going to say suffer, but just have. Um, and then you can look at connection length, the length of the fibers in the brain, they're longest in the human system. This variability between people in functional connectivity is greatest in this human system. It's a plastic system. It's a system that can be adaptable. Um, if we look at myelination, so when myelination is sort of, it's sort of inversely related to plasticity. If you think of canalization and the rooting and reinforcement of patterns, that's what myelin does, um, and it's weak, it's lightest, and it remains light as we mature. There's a protracted kind of delay in the myelination process in the human system. If you look at semantic processing, uh, we process the most abstract information in the human system, or concrete in the sensory motor cortex. Temporal windows, longer temporal windows are processed by the human system, a particularly uh, fast, rapid type of metabolism that doesn't depend on oxygen delivery, aerobic glycolysis uh, associated with the human system. And just a reminder that psychedelics particularly affect the human system. Uh, and so the tempting thing is to think, in a sense, oh, well, with the DMN, DMN functioning as a correlate of ego functioning, we were some of the way there, but I think with this pattern now, this principal gradient that, in a sense, defines the human brain is probably where it's at when it comes to the neural correlates of ego disintegration. The breakdown of the boundaries of this human system, it becoming a more globally coherent and interconnected quality of whole brain function is probably the neural correlates of this thing that we call ego dissolution, which of course is just another way of referring to the unit of experience in a sense. It's kind of a yin to, to the yang. One thing goes away, and without self as being different and separate from others, there's a sense of union with others and everything. Um, the unit of experience and ego dissolution going so closely hand in hand. Now, you won't be able to read this, so I'll read it for you. One thing you can do these days with all the brain imaging data we have is put in like regions or patterns into the system and then see what functions they're associated with from all the studies that have been run. When you do that from, for the human system, social cognition, emotion at, at the top, you know, I think this is nice to see. We often think of ourselves as, you know, analytical beings as, in nature, but, uh, but perhaps not, or we might put all the emphasis on language. Yes, language is up there, verbal semantics. But uh, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a curious thing. And down at the other end, motor function and, and, and these more rudimentary functions. So um, yeah, there's a lot to work out here, but there's a thread. There's a thread to follow, is, is my point. So. I'll um, tell you a little bit about this Rebus model, which is sort of related but different to what we've just been talking to. 
It's a model uh, that says that um, psychedelics act on the mind and the brain to relax our confidence in our assumptions, relaxed beliefs under psychedelics. Um, and it, it's inspired by a model of the mind and the brain that really dominates cognitive neuroscience. I think it's fair to say cognitive psychology and increasingly so psychiatry as well. And it's called a few different things, but hierarchical predictive processing is, is one. It notes that the mind and the brain and that the evidence in the brain is so compelling now is organized hierarchically. And part of that organization, what it, what it gives us is an ability to kind of take shortcuts to kind of reduce the world down to like heuristics that are easy and simple and broad brush and make sense and that'll do kind of thing. We don't process all the granularity of the world. We just think, well, this, this is enough. This'll, this, this'll get, me, get me going and, and get me by. And, uh, you know, neat, neat kind of examples like this where the text is somewhat jumbled up. Actually, the first and last letter are in, in order. I think that might be what the text is saying. And you can read it because of our ability to, you know, create these holes, kind of shortcut when we experience the world. Um, and this one, uh, I don't know how many times you've seen it. I've seen it plenty now. I loaded it up earlier. And if I'm not prepared, just straight away I'm hallucinating the motion that doesn't actually exist. And the reason being, because if you were to see something like this in the world, uh, there would be motion. So that's the model, and that's what's called up, and that's our experience. So we're experiencing the world through our beliefs, our assumptions, our models. Um, and under psychedelics, the idea is that, and I think this is compelling, especially when you think of ego dissolution. If you think of the assuredness that you have as you navigate the world, confidence, if you want, uh, in what's what, in who you are, and so on. Um, under a psychedelic, it's really that that's, that's hammered so, so clearly and obviously and beautifully, in a sense. Um, and uh, that's, that's what we're talking about here, the relaxing, the relaxing of that assuredness about what's what. Uh, it's easier, in a sense, to describe it in the perceptual domain, but the perception of a coherent sense of self is a, still a perception. It's just very high level. Um, but the high level makes sense probably because that's where these receptors are. So, you know, you don't need a huge dose of a psychedelic to get a sense of what ego dissolution really means, even if it hasn't obliterated your your ego, you still get that flavor. And perhaps it's a flavor that's actually really hard to get and know without psychedelics. Of course, it's talked about in context of meditation and spiritual practice and so on. But do you really feel it? Do you really know it? And yet it becomes so stark, so obvious under the influence of a psychedelic. So I'm jumping around again, and this, this is related to Rebus, but it's um, asking the question of, in a sense, what encodes these beliefs and our confidence in them? And one property of the human system is that it seems to uh, house a lot of properties associated with top-down functioning. So from the top, from high-level abstraction, down to lower, more rudimentary uh, function. Um, and if you look at the flow of oscillating activity in the brain um, and you have people just resting, relaxing with their eyes closed, the direction of what we call traveling waves, like how you drop a pebble in a still pool, the waves will travel from the center out. That's what we're talking about here. These are oscillations that are moving in a direction. With eyes closed, the direction is top down very simple way of doing it, just saying a hierarchy goes from prefrontal cortex to visual cortex, more rudimentary at the back, higher level, more abstract at the front, eyes closed, the direction is top down, nothing to see here. Uh, if you open your eyes, all of a sudden, retina hit with, with photic information and, and then back, 
to the back of the brain and the information flow goes bottom up. There's stuff to process. Uh, that's what happens, eyes closed like, to eyes open. What if you have eyes closed and you inject someone with DMT? Well, our strong hypothesis was that we would see in the brain something like the lights going on, that the direction of the traveling waves would flip from the top down with eyes closed, nothing to see, to stuff to see. And we saw it so starkly, it was remarkable. Um, so this is just, you know, in a sense, part of baby steps of trying to decode what is going on, yes, in the brain, in the future in the body as well, uh, with, with psychedelics. Um, and uh, I talked about ego dissolution and that sort of fitting in. But also, in a sense, I think probably what's, What's the harder problem, but the juicier fruits, if we can get it, is why psychedelic? Why psyche revealing? Ego dissolution is about a thing going away, but what about the stuff coming up, you know? Um, and I think that's such a juicy fruit to go after. It's just so hard to know how we'll do it. But one candidate place to look is the bottom-up flow of information and one intuition is, well, let's look at the development of the brain, and we could talk about old brain in an evolutionary sense, old brain more concerned with, um, not super old, but like mammalian brain, so care, emotion, maternal attachment, and so on, um, and, um, and then new brain, so neocortex and cognition, imagination, ego, and all that stuff. You know, is there, a, is there an increase in information flow up from old mammalian brain up to human uh, system would be one way to, to go at this. Now, I'm mindful as much as you'll be, you know, why do all this? <laughs> Does it matter? And uh, I, I'm quite easy with the thought of it doesn't have to matter. You know, you could do your psychedelic therapy and do it incredibly well and not have needed to know anything about the brain. And for me, it, it's taken a little bit of time to realize it, but I, I think, you know, at least as things are right now, and perhaps always, I would, can't think of ever really bridging that gap. I think there is an essential dualism here to appreciate. And so for me, I just get off on wanting to know the biology. I just want to know. Like if you love, you know, hugging trees or the wonder of trees, you also really enjoy reading a little bit about the science of trees. So it's not for everyone, but you know. <laughs> there you go. Take it or leave it. Um, Salicylin versus acetalopram, so back down to earth. Shoes on. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, a two-arm trial, double-blind RCT. You'll have heard it referred to in, in different contexts and different arenas. Um, and so I just want to summarize the study um, and, um, and highlights a, a couple of important points. Um, very briefly, the design. Um, we say psilocybin versus escitalopram for simplicity. Psilocybin arm is two doses of 25 milligrams, quite high dose, uh, three weeks apart. Population, major depressive disorder, so not treatment-resistant depression. This is broadly defined depression, which I think was a very good decision. Pleased about that one. Um, uh, because it had broader implications. Um, and about two-thirds of the sample had, they came into the trial without any history of, um, any recent history of psychiatric medication. That's important, you'll hear in a moment. Um, so quite different in a sense, similar but different to the previous trial that we'd done in treatment-resistant depression. Here are all the outcome measures, or the, the main ones really. And uh, at the head of a trial um, for good practice, so you don't cherry pick after the trial the results that are your favorite because they show your favorite treatment in the best light, you choose a primary outcome measure and make a primary hypothesis. As it happens, our primary hypothesis was not on the primary outcome measure, which might sound confusing and is a little unusual. Um, but the primary outcome measure was this quids measure this is what we call a forest plot, and here's the quids at the top. If these bars, which are confidence intervals, cross the central line, uh, if this was to cross the central line, 
then we would, uh, we, we would say that we are greater than 95% certain that there is a true difference between these conditions. On this outcome, it didn't quite make it, and that dominated the way the paper was edited, I would say, not by me, um, but written up and published. Um, and uh, here are the other outcome measures where we can say with uh, greater than 95% confidence uh, this condition was superior than this con condition, or there was a significant difference. There was a difference, a true difference between these conditions. These are other um, depression rating scales, handy, very old classic one, Madras, one that's used in most clinical trials, BDI, is a self-rated scale like the quiz. These are all separating, then we've got emotional avoidance. These are all going in an improvement direction, anhedonia, work and social functioning, flourishing, anxiety, trait anxiety, well-being, and suicidality. So I, there's a fuller picture to this trial, I think, than has been reported in the main paper, which is that psilocybin does pretty well. And um, uh, see that miss on the primary outcome measure with a critical mind, as you should see everything in science, scrutinize it and ask, is it real? Is there really no significant difference between these treatment conditions. If we were to look at absolute outcomes, response and remission rates, uh, they were, remission rates mean that according to your score, you no longer meet criteria for depression. Those scores for remission were twice as high in the psilocybin group at the end of the trial than in the escitalopram group. Um, so, um, and that was on the most conservative measure in relation to that metric. If we look at response rates, which is a halving of your baseline score, 70% in the psilocybin condition and 50% in the escitalopram, according to the quiz. So all I'm saying is just, you know, be critical when you read all of these papers. Um, I know it's, you just want the headlines, and those headlines can be really glowing about psychedelics, or they could say that there's no difference to see here. And if you can take a bit of time and at least look at the values themselves, then you can, you can get a clearer picture of what's going on. You can see the timeline of the effects with psilocybin versus escitalopram. It's quite interesting that escitalopram did, this is well-being, did pretty well early on, and you can see the drops in the depression scores. We think this is a thera therapist effect in a sense. They're getting a very good quality of therapeutic care in both conditions, and that probably accounts for uh, the drop that we also see in the escitalopram condition. Um, now, I wanted to t tell you about this trial really because of um, this. And what's happened since we published is what happens when you, you publish, particularly in a, in a journal like the New England Journal of Medicine, is on a, you know, in a sense, controversial or provocative study and, and result, you invite a lot of letters that come in. And we probably had uh, something like eight or nine letters to us from different uh, scientists and clinicians around the world asking about different things. Now, one clinician in the UK wrote to us and said, what about discontinu discontinuing um, your usual psychiatric meds? Did it affect the, the results at all? Um, there's a little bit of you know, uh, interest at the moment in the so-called discontinuation syndrome, the difficulty of coming off, particularly SSRI, antidepressant medications, and um, you know how, how much of a problem that is and how long does this so-called syndrome last for the so-called withdrawal effects um, after, after coming off the medications. And what we found is that, um, like I said, the majority, about 60%, um, a little bit higher, of the sample in our study didn't discontinue any medications when they came into the trial. They might have tried them five years ago, but that, that doesn't really count. They weren't medicated when they contacted us and then had to have a supervised uh, reduction in, in their medication. So everyone recognizes that it's not easy to come off and you know, maybe the, the medication's having some effect and symptom severity could leap up if you come off your meds, that's often seen. Um, and so they're carefully tapered off their medication. 
And, uh, and, and so what we did is we split the sample. You won't be able to read the figures, but I'll tell you. Um, we split the sample into those who didn't discontinue, the majority, and then the other third of the sample who did withdraw off their usual medication to come into the study. Now, the effect of that, of that splitting the group into those two groups, had a colossal impact on the results of this trial. Um, and it went in uh, two directions. It, 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 um, if you um, discontinued some meds and you went into the escitalopram group, you actually did well. You did well. And if you uh, discontinued meds and you went into the psilocybin group, it quashed the really positive effects that we saw with the psilocybin. So if you read it that way, had everyone in our trial discontinued conventional medications when they came into the trial, there would be nothing at all to see in terms of difference between these two groups. No differences at all, nothing trending, everything non-significant. But look at it another way. Uh, I said the majority of the sample didn't come off any medications when they came into the trial. Uh, what if we only look at that subsample? Well, then those who go into the uh, psilocybin group do remarkably well. I'm not sure if this would be meaningful to you, but a drop of minus 17 points on the Madras. Colossal, massive improvement in depressive symptom severity in those who didn't have to come off meds. They weren't on any meds when they came into the trial. If you go into the escitalopram group, very, very modest effect. So basically, everything across the board was highly, highly significantly favoring psilocybin for efficacy if you, in a sense, had fresh bodies and brains that didn't withdraw off conventional meds when they came into the trial. I think that this has major implications for what's going on right now. Uh, it very much complicates the picture of fitting in psilocybin therapy and probably this is true beyond just psilocybin. There's some results from MAPS work uh, with MDMA therapy that suggested something similar. Discontinuation was a problem. Um, so how do we slot this in? It would be convenient if it was just another tool in the toolkit and, uh, yeah, alongside SSRIs, no problem. But, hmm, these results are suggesting there could be a problem here. So, you know... Again, with this, I don't have all the answers as to why discontinue, discontinuing meds um, meant you responded well then when going back onto a conventional med, but you might think, well, the body and brain knows that kind of medication and it's good to go back onto it. It abates any kind of discontinuation effect. And then with psilocybin, a quashed responsiveness to psilocybin with a background, a recent background of, of medication, maybe because you're down-regulating the serotonin 2A receptors that the psilocybin has to hit. It could be both those things. I don't know. We don't know yet. More science is needed there. But what's highlighted is, you know, we have, we have an issue here. So I'll draw it to a conclusion uh, with that and um, thank uh, everyone. <laughs> uh, but more specifically, uh, my colleagues at the Center for Psychedelic Research, um, the entire team and those who've nurtured it and supported it and funded it and allowed it to happen, the first in the world. Um, and uh, what a delight it's been to, to, uh, to, to walk this path um, for the last, um, gosh, 15 years or so. I should shut up now. Thank you for listening. <laughs>